I'll be speaking about the results, these are the partial results, from the NTP chronic carcinogenicity study that I mentioned previously began thinking about in the year 2000. Okay. Within the US government, there are two agencies that are particularly involved in RF radiation and health effects. One is the US FDA, and they nominated cell phone radiation to the NTP. Uh, and the reason for this was back in the year 2000, exposure was widespread, but nothing like it is today. Little was known about the potential health effects from long-term exposure. There had been some studies, but they were of not decent quality. The guidelines then were protect, uh, based on protection from acute injury from uh, thermal effects. Epidemiology studies that were available at that time, and there were some, indicated a potential increase in glial cell uh, tumors in the brain, gliomas, and vestibular schwannomas. These are acoustic neuromas. Uh, the, a large part of this was based on work done in Sweden by Hardell, and they were considered may be associated with cell phone use. However, there were a number of inconsistent results in the literature, and studies in laboratory animals did not show an association with exposure to RF. Uh, and in the year 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is part of the WHO, classified radiofrequency radiation as possibly carcinogenic to humans. Okay. So, as I mentioned, in 2011, IARC determined that there was cell phone radio frequency radiation was uh, a possible human carcinogen. This was based on what's called limited evidence in human. There had been positive associations observed with exposure to RF radiation from wireless phones. This were the gliomas and acoustic neuromas. There were also negative cohort studies. However, these have the potential for misclassifications when you're looking at large populations and you don't have exposure information on the individual. The positive case control studies, which showed the gliomas and acoustic neuromas, are considered to have a potential uh, selection bias. Therefore, the evidence was considered limited, not sufficient, by uh, IARC. The evidence in experimental animals was also considered limited because the whole animal studies were negative. There were some positive studies with co-carcinogenicity. Overall, then, the evidence was considered possibly carcinogenic to humans and group 2B. So what does limited evidence mean? Limited evidence means that a causal interpretation between exposure and cancer is credible, but chance and bias or confounding cannot be reasonably ruled out. Limited evidence in experimental animals indicates that a carcinogenic effect, but not necessarily definitive because it may be only a single study or benign neoplasms, uh, was observed. So possibly carcinogenic to humans indicates that there's limited evidence in humans and less than sufficient evidence in animals. To, to reach a level of probable human carcinogenicity to humans, Limited evidence in humans would be adequate if there is sufficient evidence in animals. And th this is an important point in terms of the use of the animal studies. Uh, so why, why do we use animals for evaluating human cancer risk? As mentioned before, there's similar biological processes of disease induction. It's unethical to intentionally expose humans to test for carcinogenicity. It may happen but it's, it's not intentionally exposure. Every known human carcinogen that has been tested adequately is carcinogenic in animals, and about a third of the human carcinogens were first identified in animals. Animal studies have also a very controlled exposure. They eliminate any potential confounding, and animal studies can eliminate the need to wait for very high incidences of a long latency human cancers before implementing any public health protective strategies. So the agencies in the US that are concerned about uh, radio frequency radiation are the FCC. They ex established the exposure guidelines. This was done in 1996. Uh, the FDA, who nominated cell phone radiation to the NTP, is also 
involved, they would be performing a risk assessment on the data from the NTP. Within the U.S. government, the data may be pre uh, prepared or developed by agencies such as the National Toxicology Program, but it's the regulatory agencies that do the quantitative risk assessment. Other agencies interested include National Cancer Institute, Environmental Protection Agency, and National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. So animal studies that had been done around the year 2000 and studies that were done in the early 2000s used what's considered a Ferris wheel uh, structure like this. Animals are placed in tubes in this Ferris wheel structure with the antenna through the center. So what's happening as, a, as this moves around, the animals are exposed. And because they're in tubes, the exposure duration per day is two hours. But uh, as you can see, one side of the animal is, ex is exposed while the other side is further away from the antenna but then it receives its exposure on the other side, like moving in a Ferris wheel. Therefore, the actual exposure to tissues is really one hour per day. And in terms of a toxicity study, what we want to know is what is the potential risk to humans from animal studies. So how, how do we typically do this in a toxicity study is we increase the dose so that we because our sensitivity is in the range of 5%, which is an extremely high level if this was a, a rate occurring in human populations. Increasing the dose is one way to demonstrate whether there is an effect and use a quantitative risk assessment to evaluate risks in the general population, which may be of the order of one in 100,000. Obviously, you can't get one in 100,000 risk from an animal study when group size is 50 or 100. Uh, so our interest was how do we increase exposure but we can't increase it too much because of the thermal effects. So what we wanted to do was to increase the time of exposure. A, two, a one hour or two hour exposure we considered to be very limited and it was because of this that the NTP began to explore alternative approaches to exposing animals. We established a collaboration with the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Colorado and with ITIS in Zurich to develop an exposure system uh, to conduct animal studies where we could expose them for almost a complete day because we knew our exposure dosimetry would be limited by the heating effects. Uh, we used 900 and 1900 megahertz because these were in the range of carrier waves used in telecommunication systems. Okay, at ITIS, the chambers were built from, they, they were based on a prototype chamber. We demonstrated the technical parameters for uh, exposure of animals to show that in a reverberation chamber, there would be equal electromagnetic fields in all regions. Uh, the 21 chambers were uh, constructed in Switzerland. They were shipped to Chicago where the studies were actually conducted. Uh, we used two signal modulations, the ones that were uh, most used in the U.S. and Europe at the time, uh, CDMA, uh, Code Division Multiple Access, and GSM. So because we had three exposure groups and a control, for each male rat, female rat, male mouse, and female mouse, we had 21 total chambers. For rats, uh, r males were in separate chambers from female rats because of the uh, larger size of a rat compared to a mouse uh, in terms of allowing exposure within a chamber. These chambers are about uh, three meters by four meters in uh, dimension. They're, they're essentially large microwave of uh, they were installed in Chicago. Uh, here's a chamber being lo loaded down, brought into the basement. Uh, this is what a typical chamber looks like at the door. It's a, uh, and the, this is the row of 21 chambers in the Chicago facility. Now, what is a chamber? As you can see in the far left over there, where we have an antenna and a paddle, 
The antenna is where the exposure is emitting from. The paddle distributes the electromagnetic fields throughout the chamber, and through uh, probe measurements, we're able to demonstrate that within the cages of yeah, every cage, they were statistically uh, uh, comparable in all regions. So uh, this is a, a chamber with uh, two cage racks. So this cage, this cage essentially had the same electromagnetic fields uh, th uh, distributed throughout the chamber. Uh, the issue uh, that's most important on reverberation chambers is that the uh, fields emanate from multiple angles. These are coming in from all directions. So it's not just one antenna uh, directly at the animal. They're, the fields are distributing throughout the chambers, coming in from multiple directions. Uh, creating that ho uh, statistically ho homogeneous uh, electromagnetic environment. Based on using this kind of a system, then, we could, we, we would not have a limit on exposure time. Uh, and w we could expose a animals as long as, as necessary. We, we figured 18 hours with a 10 minute on, 10 minute off would be uh, sufficient to challenge the null hypothesis that there are no effects associated with uh, cell phone radiation. Okay. This is uh, uh, data that was presented by us to us from ITIS. They developed mouse and rat models. And as I mentioned, the fields are coming in from all directions. This is one in which they calculated the relative absorption in tissues uh, when you have 12 different polarizations. And w we looked at the mouse at 900, the mouse at 1.9 gigahertz, the rat, and you can see that in the mouse at 900, the tail is the strong absorber, and in the rat at 1900 megahertz, the tail is the strong absorber. Obviously, we we're not interested in just exposing the tail to, of the animals and excluding the other tissues. That was the reason why 900 megahertz was used for the rats, and 1900 megahertz was used for the mice. This, this is, the absorption is less in the tail, and you can see that our main interest was in the brain, where there's very little deviation. So that when we talk about a uh, SAR, specific absorption rate, of one gram per kilogram, uh, one, I'm sorry, watt per kilogram, the level in the brain is essentially the same as that which is presented to the whole animal. So this is a showing a deviation. Uh, obviously, in the fat, which is a poor absorber, the uh, dose symmetry in the fat tissue is less compared to the relative whole body because it's a fat tissue which does not absorb. So the NTP studies were conducted in three phases. One was a thermal pilot study to determine what would be the exposure intensity that we could use without overheating the animals. Uh, that study was conducted at 4 and 12 watts per kilogram. We then conducted a 28-day study to determine would there be effects that might uh, be detrimental to uh, a study that would be conducted for two years. Then we conducted the two-year study. In all studies, uh, the exposures were essentially now nine hours per day because the total was 18 hours and 20 minutes with a 10-minute on, 10-minute off cycle. So that when one chamber was exposed, a different chamber was unexposed, and we could use amplifiers uh, for two chambers throughout the, the daily exposures. Okay. So rats were exposed to both G GSM and CDMA at 900 megahertz, and mice were exposed to GSM and CDMA modulated signals at 1900. Quickly, this is a demonstration of the uh, thermal effects associated with exposures by increasing the SAR. We used animals of different weights, different ages. Uh, this was done in rats and mice. We used pregnant rats. And you can see that uh, our interest was not to allow a one degree uh, temperature rise in centigrade. And at 12 is obviously too high for males, but in the region of 6 watts per kilogram, we're less than 1 degree rise in uh, whole body temperature. 
This, these were determined with microchips implanted in the interscapular uh, region of the animals. Uh, in the okay, so the, the, these results suggested that the six watt per kilogram would be adequate for a chronic study. In the 28 day study, rats in our studies were conduct began exposure at gestation day six. So the, these are uh, in utero exposures. They're exposed from gestation day six through lactation and then two years uh, post-lactation. There was an increased uh, pup loss when went to higher exposure uh, concentrate uh, do doses. Okay. In May of this past year, NTP released the partial report. And I, I call this partial because not all of the data have been reported, but all of the incidence values for brain tumors and schwannomas have been completed. Uh, the NTP goes through a three-phase period of pathology review. It's first the original pathologist from the study laboratory reviews 40 tissues per animal. There's nearly 3,000 animals in this study. Uh, so the pathologists from the laboratory make their first determination. It then goes through a quality assessment review by another pathologist. They read all of the identified lesions, especially the, t the tumor lesions, as well as 10% of unidentified uh, animals with no lesions to see if anything was missed. And thirdly, it goes through what's called a pathology working group, which is a group of pathologists, not just from NTP, but group of pathologists, including NTP pathologists and outside pathologists with expertise in the areas of interest in brain or heart. Uh, these people then review the differences between the quality assessment pathologist, the original pathologist, and come up with the final determination of what the incidence values are. That has been done and that will not be repeated because these then become the final numbers. Okay. So why did the NTP release this information in a partial format? Well, many reasons. There's a, much public interest in this kind of uh, uh, findings uh, because of the widespread use of uh, cell phones. The tumor types that were identified here were, were gliomas and schwannomas of the heart, which are similar to those that were observed in the epidemiology studies of cell phone users. Therefore, these findings then support the IR conclusions of a potential uh, carcinogen. And when we look at incidence values, you've got to remember that there's a widespread global use of cell phones. We're, we're talking in the multi-billions of people who use cell phones. So that even if there's a small increase in incidence, the issue is really what is the risk? Because the incidence is incidence in animals of group size 100. We can't distinguish if it's much less than 5%. But through a risk assessment approach, you can evaluate what would be the risk with exposures, different exposure durations uh, on the risk for uh, cancers that are identified within this study. Okay. The NTP used Harlan spray dolly rats. The SARs were 0, 1.5, 3, and 6. Uh, GASM, CDMA modulated in utero on gestation day, uh, beginning on gestation day five. There was an interim evaluation at 19 weeks and the study terminated after two years. Uh, okay, within the peri so perinatal effects, there were no exposure related effects that were observed in this study on pregnancy or littering, but there were decreases in body weights uh, of male and female pups uh, on postnatal day one. So animals that were exposed in utero were, were of less body weight, the pups, uh, when they were born. Also, after lactation for three weeks, uh, there was the, the body weights of the uh, young animals was still less than the control animals. Now, survival of rats in this study
is an important issue because uh, the survival appeared to be uh, better in the treated than in the controls. The filled in squares are the controls and this is the unfilled squares are the, I'm showing here the uh, CDMA 6 watt per kilogram. This is the highest exposure and you can see that during the course of the two year study the CDMA actually had poorer survival. Once we got out to week 95 they were essentially the same and then uh, control rats were dying uh, at a f faster rate than the CDMA. Why that happened I don't know but uh, th th this is a, an issue that has been raised a number of times so we've got a question were the animals at risk were they at sufficient risk to develop tumors? You can see that if by week 95 there's no difference in fact the statistical comparison between these two is non-significant uh, which leads me to feel that this was not a non-issue within the CDMA uh, experiment. Okay. So currently uh, the only findings that are being reported are the identified target organs. The two were in the heart which were schwannomas. These are of the uh, nerve sheath and gliomas. This is a uh, histopathologic diagram of the heart which identified the schwannoma. Uh, I'm not a pathologist so I can't see the cell type clear enough. Yeah. It's pretty clear to a pathologist but uh, it's in this particular region here I, I can't see the, the cell dis what, what the cell nature is but the staining is obviously quite different. Uh, so in the heart lesions the, there were proliferative heart lesions the schwannomas you can see uh, in the GSM went up to 5.5% uh, with the CDMA modulation up to 6.6% with none in the controls. There were also hyperplasias, Schwann cell hyperplasias in the heart. Uh, hyperplasias are essentially a preneoplastic lesion. These are excessive growth uh, number of cells in a focalized lesion which has that potential to go on to develop into a tumor. So if we look at all of these you can see that with zero in the control and in the CDMA modulation with the male rats at six watts per kilogram we're approaching 10 percent of proliferative lesions in that study group. This is okay uh, typically what you, you compare control animals to other studies uh, in which there were control animals. However, in this particular case, we don't have a comparable control because in this case, the animals were exposed in the shielded rooms such that there were no electromagnetic fields penetrating from outside and nothing penetrating outside. The EMFs that were generated within were absorbed by the animals and that's how we set the dose symmetry. So we, we actually have no comparable control. When, in, when you look at historical controls even among other types of studies and inhalation studies are considered different than a feeding study so that it's appropriate to compare historical controls by the nature of the exposure route because in this case it's very different within the exposure chambers. Uh, this this I, I already did. Okay, th this is a sort of micrograph of a brain where the glioma is seen here, and the pathologist says it's very good. <laughs> so I, I, t I take her word for it. Uh, but you can see the differential staining within the site where the glioma is present. So th of the proliferative lesions in the male rats, there were uh, increases and in positive trends for gliomas uh, in male rats with GSM and with CDMA. And there's also the hyperplastic lesions, again, preneoplastic lesions that are observed in the exposed animals, none in the controls. So again, similar to the heart, we're up to about 5% of animals showing proliferative lesions uh, 
with both CDMA modulation and with uh, GSM modulation. In female rats, there were incidences of gliomas and glial cell hyperplasias of the brain. Uh, the numbers were smaller than in male rats, uh, but the controls were zero. And again, this was not significant, no significance, but it's hard to say whether these are biologically significant because of the observation what was seen in male rats. Female rats tend to be less prone to developing uh, brain lesions than male rats. So in summary, body weights at birth and throughout lactation in rat pups uh, tended to be lower than controls. There were increased incidence of schwannomas in the hearts of male rats. Uh, there were significant uh, SAR dependent positive trends for both GSM and CDMA and a significant increase at six watts per kilogram with the CDMA modulation. There were significant SAR dependent trends for increased gliomas in the brain of rats exposed to CDMA modulated RFR. Uh, the lesions in female rats were not significantly different. The conclusion in that partial report was that the lesions, the hyperplasias and glial cell neoplasms were likely the result of whole body exposure to GSM and C or CDMA modulated RFR. And uh, the, 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 expo the value seemed to be more obvious with the heart lesions than in the brain. Uh, exposures in female rats were non-significant. NTP anticipates that the complete data set for rats, mice will be peer reviewed uh, at a public meeting either the end of this year or early 2018. Uh, lastly, within this study, as, as I mentioned, there was an interim sacrifice at 19 weeks, which is fairly early. It's not a chronic. And studies were conducted using the comet assay to look for DNA strand breaks. And this was observed in male rats, female rats, male mice, and female mice. Here's an uh, observation for male rats of the uh, frontal cortex as a function of the SAR. And this is a summary of all of the data where DNA strand breaks were observed in rats, male or female. Uh, the most, the strongest responses were in the frontal cortex in both rats and mice. The trends were significant and the pairwise comparison between the dose group and the controls were significant. Uh, uh, DNA strand breaks were also seen in the cerebellum, the hippocampus, uh, in males in the liver and in the blood, that would be peripheral lymphocytes, uh, and the others shown here. So what are the, are the importance of these results? These results are quite important because the incidence of the brain tumors and the schwannomas of the heart and the exposure-related increases in DNA damage in brain cells support that IR conclusion based on gliomas and acoustic neuromas among long-term uh, cell phone users. The exposure intensities were limited by potential the heating effect at higher levels. So we're limited in terms of how high an exposure we could go. And these are similar to or slightly higher than the RF emissions from cell phones. Cell phones uh, in the US, uh, the limit is established at 1.6 uh, watts per uh, kilogram. We, we, were use, we used 1.5, 3, and 6. So we're not, not that different compared to uh, cell phone emissions. Uh, as I mentioned, survival was sufficient to detect precancerous lesions in the brain and heart of controls. There was no statistical difference that I tried to show between male rats and the exposure group with the highest rate of gliomas and heart schwannomas. And there were no hyperplasias, uh, glial cell hyperplasias, which are a precancerous lesion, or heart schwannomas in any control rat, even though there were glial cell hyperplasias detected in exposed rats as early as week 58. At week 58, there was no difference in survival between the controls and the uh, exposed groups. So that if 
you see a preneoplastic lesion of 58 in an exposed animal, there was sufficient uh, time for this to occur in a control rat as well. And in a two-year study, there was a heart schwannoma detected as early as week 70 in exposed rats. So I conclude that the survival issue, which has been raised a number of times, is not really a driving force for the results that are observed in this study. Uh, NTP is looking into possibility of uh, some follow-up work in terms of using smaller chambers to answer more of a mechanistic type of uh, studies. Uh, some of these relate to uh, ox understanding oxidative stress, replicating some of the genetic toxicity findings, uh, and maybe looking for uh, molecular changes in the heart. And with that, I want to mention that the NTP study director now is Michael White. He took over after I retired in 2009 and NTP associate director is John Booker. The agencies that we worked with, uh, NIEHS is part of the National Institutes of Health. The studies were conducted in Chicago at ITRI. NIST helped us, uh, the physicists, in designing the exposure system, and the ITIS Foundation in Zurich uh, was instrumental in working out the dosimetry, building the chambers, and validating the exposure intensities within them. Uh, thank you. I want to thank you again very much because this was not what you know you had planned to do and I think as the former study director and really architect of the study we're very fortunate very very fortunate to have you here and I really want to thank okay. you thank you why don't we take questions now um, and then we'll break for have a short coffee break um, Tony I have two questions first is I have two questions the first is uh, do you have any data other than you've shown in relation to mice because they were at a higher level of exposure, as I understand it. And the second is, could you comment on the fact that uh, in humans we're talking about acoustic neuromas, schwannomas around the, the uh, acoustic nerve, whereas here you're talking about the heart. Right. Okay, well, well, the mouse study results haven't been, haven't been reported. Uh, they were the same... The, the same SAR values were used for mice, the 6, 3, and 1.5. One difference between them, well, there's two differences. One is the frequencies were different. Whether that matters or not, I don't know. But also, in the rats, I indicated that the exposures began on gestation day 6. In the mice, the intention was to expose them during exposure, but the B6, C3, F1 mouse that is used in NTP studies tend to eat their pups. So... We had to not <laughs> you start them from in utero exposure. They began in the typical NTP fashion of at six weeks of age. And in terms of the acoustic neuroma versus schwannoma of the heart, yeah, they're obviously different locations, but it's the same cell type, Schwann cells. And that, that's why that concordance is one which lends to believe that pr these show that type of relationship that uh, adds interest to the uh, acoustic neuromas story. Thank you very much for this, so, for this important uh, talk and very clear talk. Uh, I think that this is really one of the most important studies that emerged on the... On Sorry? Sigal, Eli. Sigal Sadecki. But, but since it's so important, I, I, I want to, and thank you very much specifically for clarifying the survival issue, which wasn't <laughs> clear up, up to now. Uh, if you could clarify a few issues. The first one is if the incidence is so low among females, why did you include females uh, in the first place? Yeah. The second... We, the we, we didn't know that. <laughs> ah, <laughs> but don't you know that naturally female rats don't have, uh, have lower rates? We know, we know that, but that's not a reason to exclude them. Depends, depends on the power calculation. This is what I'm asking. Yeah, if, yeah. If, you knew, if you knew well, in advance that, you're not so, that the power calculations, would, that you would not expect increased risk among females, why did you include them? This is number one. Number two is, um, um, do you think according to these results, wait, wait a minute, number two is, uh, I just want to make sure that the controls are right 
And therefore, I would like to ask you, were you surprised that there were zero tumors among the controls, meaning did you expect any background tumors among the controls? So these are two methodological issues. And the we don't know the results of the study until we conduct it, obviously. We didn't know whether we would see any tumors in male rats. Well, we, 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 don't, we don't know whether there would be an effect of RF on male rats or female rats. No, no, you asked male, female, wait, wait. the male, female. Uh, hold on, hold on. Um, the, the, I think what, what Ron is trying to say is that whenever you start out a study, you don't know what the results are going to be. There could be a possibility that even though the background would be low, the study could be causing this. There are examples, for, as you know very well, that you get breast tumors in male animals sometimes, even though you don't expect them. Yeah, no, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, 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 what? what The control, yeah, right, but, but it depends. First of all, the, we, we typically did not use Harlan spray dolly rats in NTP studies. That's, this was the first study that actually used Harlan spray dollies. It used to be the Fisher 344 rat, mm -hmm. right. switched over to, to a different rat uh, strain. Uh, in terms of the control rate, uh, the, the, as I mentioned, these were exposed in reverberation chambers. There's no external electromagnetic fields that these animals are exposed, exposed to. I have no idea what that might be doing to animals. Our interest, pre as we designed the study, was to make sure that the brain was exposed because the brain was the focus from the epidemiology studies. That's why when I showed the uh, graph of the different uh, organ exposures, our interest was the brain, obviously not the tail, and the brain exposures were uh, within one decibel of the whole body exposure. Secondly, because of the low rate of tumors that are seen in the brain of animals, we increase the group size. Typically an NTP study is done with 50 animals. Uh, we increased it to, to 50 to try to increase the power. Our statisticians told us to increase it further, we might not see a whole lot more uh, uh, power within the study, we might have to go to a very large number, and uh, as you can see, uh, we could only fit 100 animals in rats in an exposure chamber. Uh, we, we would have had to double, triple the size to, ex to increase the power even further where we might have seen a control rat with a tumor, but, you know, Perhaps you these can talk are the data about this. quite fairly consistently among studies, and this may be leading into a mechanism that is one of the characteristics identified by IARC in a paper by Smith uh, last year, characteristics of human carcinogens. One is one of the nine or ten characteristics includes oxidative stress so, so and genetic damage. Is you, 